and other inventive mediums. This is your host, Marianela Medrano. I am the founder of Palabra Training Center, where words are giving us medicine. And today, my guest is someone whose work coincides with mine at so many interceptions that I'm beginning to think we are twin sisters separated <laughs> at birth. <laughs> we certainly have the hair. <laughs> yes, we have the hair. Francesca Maxime is a Haitian, Dominican, Italian American somatic psychotherapist, life coach, an embodied anti racism educator in New York City. She is also an award winning poet and author, former television journalist, and host of the Rerooted podcast on the Be Here Now Network. She sees adults, couples, and families virtually around the world to support the emergence, their emergence and well-being. You can learn more about Francesca at www.maximedclarity.com. That's an easy one to remember. <laughs> Welcome, Francesca. It is an honor to have you here. Muchas gracias, Marilena. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful to, to have you here. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure. So this podcast is all about palabras, words. So let's start with what was your first encounter with words, with the palabra? When did you first realize that also, this is kind of two questions in one. When did you first realize there is a somatic language? Um, that's interesting. I don't know if they're the, you know, the right answer. That was my mom in the background. She's visiting, helping me do my taxes. Um, she sent me to Montessori school when I was young. And I remember that we would learn how to trace letters uh, in sand on little boards. And so a B, you'd feel a B with a uh -huh. sand B and then you do Bob or Bub or Bib or whatever. And so I think that the tactile nature of the sand on the finger is a somatic process that is very sensory that they're tying in in a very organic way that now having studied the nervous system, having studied all these other things that actually Ron Montessori philosophy is rooted in, which is the relationality, the social engagement system, things we can talk about if we talk about polyvagal theory and Stephen Portis's work. But um, as far as words are concerned, uh, you know, I think if you, if you go back to the uh, old sort of om or um or um, you know, these sort of ancient vibrations, you know, there, there's this old, there's a saying people will say words are vibrations in terms of how words sort of reverberate, meaning that once we name something, we give it power. And I remember as a news anchor, you know, I'm kind of going all over the place, but as a news anchor, there was a whole sort of fight when I was a member of National Association of Hispanic Journalists and National Association of Black Journalists and whatnot, to really name undocumented workers as opposed to illegal immigrants, to really name, you know, what is happening as opposed to, you know, the framing. So the words do have power, words are vibrations, but those words, back to the om, to the ahem, to the, you know, sort of this universality, this vibration, it's also a very sensorial experience in your body in much the same way that the sand is on your finger when you're tracing a little letter on the, on the, on the board. And it's also a very um, sort of uh, uh, opening of experience. And I think that those two things, this idea of like, the viciousness or the violence in naming something incorrectly from a left brain standpoint to categorize based on value systems and judgment versus the actual experience of learning a letter, putting together a word, feeling and integrating that into your body and really owning that and knowing what that is. I think that kind of depicts sort of, you know, sort of the split, the sort of the divide and, and, and that they can very much work together 
you know, as Ian McGill Chris talks about a lot, the left brain and the right brain and sort of, but, but we've put the wrong one first. We've allowed our left brain to guide us when in fact our right brain guides us and the left brain is the one that's supposed to do the, you know, sort of do the marching afterwards. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's a long sort of yeah. our answer, but it's an opening anyway. Very rich, very rich. There is so much I can pull from that. Um, you know, what you were saying, how careful we must be with words um, and how we use them. Do you think, will you say that then that somatic language gets louder um, depending on what's happening, let's say after trauma, the somatic language then speaks louder than... You mean that when you say somatic language, can you clarify with me? The, what you the language of the body, the, the resonance, the vibrations in the body, right? That might be, I the body might I be think. more sensitive, yeah. right? To well, what's interesting is, is I don't know that it actually is more loud mm -hmm. or less loud. I think mm -hmm. it's all adaptive. And so if you're in a balanced, equanimous, nourishing, securely attached environment, then you're going to respond in a way that is quote unquote, normal or balanced or not um it's not going to be provocative in some way but mm -hmm. knowing that we're always adapting that our soma that our body or we're always adapting to the situation that's in front of us and that we sort of long after play out whatever that script or that programming is whatever that programming is long after it's due what i think you're pointing to when you say you know is is, is the somatic language, the, la the language of trauma, is that more evidenced, you know, um, over time because of trauma? I think what you're pointing to is, is that when we haven't gotten what we needed when we were younger, do we still have the markers behaviorally in, in our soma that present as quote unquote negative or undesirable or, you know, challenging in our current life or problematic? Yes, but I would say that those are just as adaptive to our history as our current securely attached behavior. If our previous, mm -hmm. uh, you know, attachment relational, you know, styles were 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 secure, that those would be adaptive, um, and those would be quote unquote appropriate. So, yes, because they're protective responses. Yeah. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I totally get your question. And so mm -hmm. the short answer is yes. You yeah. know, uh, the, the, you know, to the point of Bessel van der Kolk, the body keeps the score right. and the, the language of trauma shows up in whatever way, whether it's irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, uh, a client was telling me the other day, you know, she was writing this email to her lover and it was like five pages long. And I was like, yeah, nobody's going to understand, you know, mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that's the thing that we see it in practice, right? Um, we see how the language of the body gets really um, loud. And sometimes it is our job to kind of point it out um, because even the person who's emitting the vibrations is not always um, aware of, of the phenomenon. No, because it's all they've ever known. Right, so, exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like you'll hear a lot of folks, I think even my mom had said it, um, you know, we grew up poor, but we didn't know we were poor because everybody was <laughs> around. It's like, you know, it's one of those things. Um, yeah, right. We didn't think of ourselves as poor or we yeah. knew somebody else who like hadn't taken a bath and they were mm -hmm. at school and they didn't have clean clothes and we, were, mm -hmm. we, knew, we, weren't, we knew we weren't them. So we mm -hmm. knew we weren't that poor, you know, yeah. like, yeah. but it wasn't like, and, and so I think that it, that normalizing sort of, um, yeah, that there's a real sense of, uh, if you've been traumatized, if you've not gotten what you needed, if you've had these adaptive strategies, they're outside your level of awareness. So a lot of the mm -hmm. basic trauma work is bringing awareness to our experiences. Mm -hmm. And usually when you realize that, in fact, you've been playing out an old program script um, that has been very adaptive, but isn't serving you today, there's either a process of anger or grief and hopefully both. 
And mm -hmm. that's what it begins the portal to then being able to use that awareness to shift uh, mm -hmm. through your intention, through your more deliberate action and different habit formations uh, behaviorally, uh, a new a new understanding, which is a beautiful insight. Some people, you know, you kind of flip a switch. You know, if you talk about memory reconsolidation and the right brain and neural synaptic changes that, you know, the neurons that fire together, wire together differently from the mm -hmm. way that people do. Mm -hmm. um, or if you talk about, uh, you know, just sort of the more slow planing of, um, of a pattern to sort of integrate, like making friends with your inner children that will often still want to act out or, you know, feel overwhelmed. That can yeah. sometimes take time to cultivate those internal relationships. Right. And I don't know if you um, agree in the sense that um, at any given point, the vocalized language um, or the body language might be um, uneven and the part of the work of the therapist is to bring the equanimity, to, to bring the balance um, so that when one is speaking, the other one can kind mm -hmm. of echo, yes. uh, harmonize yes. in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, to be more, um, I think the term, you know, coherent, uh, more integrated, right. more, yes. uh, more reflective of one another. Because you'll hear people say all the time, like, I don't have a problem or I don't have any feeling about that or whatever it is. And I think one of the best things someone can do as a therapist uh, or a coach or whatever you are, uh, if you're working with someone mm -hmm. is to be really in tune with your own, um, whatever's happening with you so that you can say, you know, Joey, when you said that you didn't feel anything about that uh, and you know, that thing that happened with your brother, or that you know thing that happened with your, your your sister, whatever that fight you had with your wife, whatever. Uh, I know that you said that like everything was fine, and I heard those words, everything's fine. And I also noticed that your foot was tapping very rapidly, that the hands that were in your lap were you know were very tight or clenched, mm -hmm. or that there was something happening you know here with your with your hair. And I'm wondering if you have any awareness of the, you know, or, or what your experience is of, of how your body is responding when I ask you some of these questions or that your voice pitch started to raise a little bit, or, you know, uh, you know, you, you could, you could, as a therapist name what you're experiencing or what you're seeing, but if that feels like it's too many eyes on the person and they would mm -hmm. get shamed or feel shamed mm -hmm. or embarrassed mm -hmm. or feel too seen or something like that, you know, you can also invite in like, as you're telling me about this, are you noticing anything inside? This mm -hmm. is the somatic experiencing approach. Any colors, any textures, mm -hmm. any images mm -hmm. come up. When you think of your mother or you think of your wife or you think of whoever you had this fight with and you're telling me things are fine, I'm wondering as you're saying those words, things are fine, what's happening for you inside? And sometimes people are completely, you know, alexymic, dysthymic when they don't have a connection between no what right. their words are and what their somatic experience is, but you can start to offer words. And, you know, there's a lot of like word wheels and feeling mm -hmm. wheels, emotion mm -hmm. wheels um, and lists that you can give people. And most people don't even know that it's okay to name things like irritation mm -hmm. or anger or despair or upset. And that they're just feelings, just like colors are colors and purple and green and it's part of the what I'm what I'm hearing is how you're describing the accompanying, the uh, the person through also reading yourself as you as you are accompanying um, yeah. and is understanding the influence. Um, let me let me go back um, specifically to you, and I guess. Um, to go to you, I'm going to go through the work of other women. And I'm thinking, um, you know, Gloria Ansaldúa, um, Maria Lugones, and Mariana Ortega, just to name three women who had worked and shaped Latino or Latinx feminism. And a, a kind of feminism that, it, that has been 
build um, or conceived from what Mariana Ortega calls the multiplicitous um, self or identity, a self that is embodied and has a foot in reality, in many realities. And as you know, Ansaldúa wrote widely about mestizaje as happening at the interception of many realities by view from the um, kind of earth body based uh, vantage point. So I'm bringing their work here to see if you can bring us into what your experience has been as a, you know, a very multiple um, or um, yeah, multiple experience with mixed uh, racial background. And what I'm curious to know in that variety of your background, how has, if, if it has whiteness has impacted your encounter with your other parts? Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps think of this question from the somatic embodiment perspective in the sense that do you switch codes depending on the environment, depending on the safetyness or... Well, I know that, that was a long... No, no, yeah, <laughs> I'll answer the back part, the last part first. Mm -hmm. I mean, code switching for sure is something that I used to do a lot more than I do now because I used to be mm -hmm. on television and before that in corporate America. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think you know, there was uh, a lot of code switching that had to take place to be a television news anchor or television news broadcaster. I remember they would always tell me, you know, you're gesticulating too much. Your facial expressions are so expressive. Your jewelry is too big. Your makeup is too heavy. Your, your thighs and hips are too large. You need to lose weight. You wear too many bold colors or patterns or whatever. And that was a real thing in terms of, you know, you can't wear your hair curly. You have to wear it straight. You have to wear it whatever it is. And um, there was so much of that, that, you know, over time, it just got to be very, very taxing and toxic, um, that eventually I, I just, you know, for that, and for a variety of other reasons, I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and so yet, and yet, excuse me, that was part of all, part of my own personality is part of what they liked about me, I think, but it was also part of what they really wanted to contain. It really depended on the context. Um, you know, they would have much rather had you be more uh, in a box, you know, like now we're all mm -hmm. in a box because we're all living on Zoom. And so, but this is the world I lived in prior to that. You know what I mean? Like right. the world that was pre-internet and I was on television, I already lived in the box. Now we all live in little Zoom boxes. We're all the Brady Bunch here. Um, mm -hmm. but, so in that way, uh, and, and I remember I even, when I think back to my days in Fortune 500 companies in corporate, it was the same. I was a 25 year old kid working in Fortune 500 company, you know, wearing nice clothes, but like maybe my skirt was a little bit short or something. And I had no awareness of like the fact that like, you know, people were going to harass me or give me a hard time or whatever it is, or, you know, and that was, it just wouldn't have occurred to me that that was quote unquote, inappropriate or, and, it, and I don't even know that it was inappropriate, but it was inappropriate to them in, you know, the heartland in middle America, Ohio, where I was working at the time. Um, in terms of the somatic piece around my multi-ethnicity, mm, I mean, my background, I didn't grow up really as much with my Haitian Dominican background, although I was influenced by it. And I never thought of myself as multiracial or biracial. I always thought of myself as just a multi-ethnic person growing mm -hmm. up. It's always how I identified. I never identified as someone who was black or who was white or who was Hispanic. I just always said that I was a multi-ethnic person. And I grew up with my Italian family in a white, you know, sort of town with my, you know, white 
you know, school friends uh, until the time I was, uh, you know, 18 and went to college, I really didn't have a lot of exposure outside of the occasional trips and visits to my father's side of the family, um, who he was black. Uh, I really didn't have a lot of exposure to my more um, Haitian Dominican side. But over there, it was definitely a different vibe, a different feeling. And there was so much trauma in those rooms from, you know, the variety of factors that led to my grandmother leaving the Dominican Republic and, you know, coming to the United States and leaving half of her kids behind, taking her other kids with her, the whole thing, getting a divorce, you know, like when all the, all the stuff, all the violence those kids endured, all the violence that my father carried forward, um, that there was both a joy and a sort of sense of, like music for sure stands out, you know, um, the suppleness of music, uh, the, mm. the, the, you know, the beat and sort of how I always had that sort of intuitive sense. My flavor for language, I think was developed, even though I wasn't fluent in Creole or French or Spanish, I learned a little bit more French later and a little bit of Spanish, but it was in my body in that way, because I think my ear had been trained. My mom had also put me to music school. And so I was studying piano and things like that and art school and dance school. Um, but I think that my, my sort of sense of myself as a intersectional, you know, uh, mixed ethnic, um, I call it white adjacent person uh, was very much always informed by my more, you know, sort of Haitian Dominican heritage. And sadly, my Italian American heritage would have been much more three dimensional or multi dimensional, also, had they not taken the root of whiteness, had they not had to take the root of whiteness, but did take the root of whiteness because assimilation was the name of the game. And that's the game that they agreed to play when they chose to come over, you know, because in my Italian family, uh, it was poverty, you know, the father died, you know, there was no money, people took the boat over, they went through Ellis Island, they were electing to come, but they were saying, okay, well, I'll pay the price. They said, give up our language, we won't speak Italian at home. They said, you know, don't, you know, eat these things, eat those things, you know, and I mean, they might have cooked some Italian meals, but it wasn't, it wasn't like the focus of the way that now you see Italian Italy is sort of celebrated in a way again, where, you know, they lost so much. Um, and so, and yet, you know, my grandfather was still pretty embodied also, danced, sang, gardened, literally had his hands in the earth. So that's, you know, my Italian side that I kind of connect with from a body sense. And that sense of earthiness, when we talk about soma, the smell, they say the oh. smell, the olfactory sense is really the first and primary and oldest sort of way. You get most of your information now through your eyes, the visual, which is why your imprinting and images are so much part of our traumatic memories. But, um, but that our smell is really the kind of oldest. And I think that that is something that I got from like my grandfather's side of the family and how he was and, and that kind of thing. So my, in my body has all of this in it. It has the music, it has the language, it has the disruption and the cut offness. And I sense that in myself, you know, it has the rhythm and it has the, the light and the joy. Um, but it also has a lot of the shame and the, the trauma and the shutdown or the sort of striving and the, and the sort of, trying to make something out of, I don't want to say out of nothing, but, you know, to keep on pushing or to keep on endeavoring. Um, I think that's, and it's not always a terrible quality, but it's certainly not a quality of just resting. You know, there's a, I'll, 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 I'll close on this. There's a saying from my um, grandfather's side of the family that his grandmother, uh, his mother, my great grandmother said to him uh, when he was taking a break, uh, you know, cause they all lived together Nowadays, kids are doing this again, right? You're 30 years old, right. you're home. But it, at the time, he was an adult, and he would have, should have been, you know, 
he would have been out of the house, but he was saving money and giving it to his mother because that's how it was. He would give his paycheck when he would go to work to his mother. Anyway, uh, she said to him when he was home, Louis, his name was Louis. Louis, while you're resting, why don't you bring in some wood? <laughs> and that's how it was. <laughs> yes, yes. It's all, and that's, you know, that that's why it's so... Um, in conceptualizing where we come from is that it is so important, right, to, to understand the role of the body, the role of movement, because that, that was the case. While you're resting, go do something. Mm -hmm. um, it's a body that's always in motion. Um, it's a body that's always connected to the earth. How much, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, ask. How much do you think... Um, this movement, this cadence, these um, <clears throat> uh, vibrations, I will call, um, has trickled into your poetry and has made it um, what it is. Mm. A lot. I mean, mm. my book was called Rooted. My second book mm. was called Rerouted because I felt uprooted. Um, mm. And my podcast is called Rerooted, R-E-R-O-T-E-D, to sort of, you know, say, well, I guess I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. Mm -hmm. um, but that idea of movement, visual sound, you know, um, I mean, life is animate always, whether or not we're looking at big changes or not, you know, and and that's within us also. In this pandemic for the last two years, I've been more sedentary than I ever have been in my entire life. I've gained back so much weight. I've been eating all kinds of sugar and carbs. My body is not in sync with me because I've just been under a lot of stress. I've been seeing a lot of clients. I've been doing a lot of work outside of things and I'm just out of sync. I'm just out of balance. And part of that's because I've been trying to not get COVID and part of that's because I've just been very busy and stressed. So my body is not particularly in sync with where my heart might want to be. <laughs> and so that's why I'm trying to kind of get back into balance. But in an ideal world, my body feels very available to the world, you know, very mm -hmm. much a, a part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, the beach, the ocean, being outside, walking around, mm -hmm. listening to music. You know, I used to dance a lot. I don't really dance anymore. I don't know why, but, mm -hmm. um, but I do remember as part of my big healing work was actually at Kripalu. Um, I was doing some dancing uh, there. Journey dance? I don't remember what they call it. I think it's journey dance. Anyway, I was doing some dancing. There were some drums and, you know, putting things into the fire, into the sort of imaginal fire. And it's really very powerful. And through my indigenous focusing oriented therapy training, we're using drums and we're using rhythm. We're using a chant that we were given by an indigenous family to be able to be uh, utilized and we're really kind of working through uh, the vibrations in the body and through sound and putting them back to the land and not just having it all in us. So the whole point is I'm not just a little thing or a little person back to this multiplicity, this mestiza, but sort mm -hmm. of, you know, Walt Whitman, even I contain multitudes, you know, you're sort right. of, you know, we're, we're part of this. And so part of the trauma work is to give it back to a place mm. that can hold it, whether it's the air, mm. the fire, the water, the land, the, you know, the river, the mountain, the birds, mm. let it carry, let it be carried, mm. you know, not just in you. Um, and if it belongs to someone else ancestrally, have that conversation, you know, mm -hmm. if it's not for you to work out, but it's going to take another generation, then do as best as you can with it here before you pass it forward. Yeah, that is, that is, you know, and I'm thinking um, Don Oscar Santillan was talking um, the other, well, last night, actually, he was talking about the importance of limpias and the importance of, I was saying to him that, that in Buddhism, it's what is called the pursuit of the emptiness, right? The getting to the emptiness and the and the the uh, integration with all that is um, through the emptiness, and then we do it also through the limpias, through the emptying out 
so mm-hmm. that then some some what is valid can come in. So I'm so glad that you're using some of these resources to help people. I know that one of the there are so many things that I want to talk to you, but um, we have another half an hour. <laughs> I know. Um, I know that you do a lot of anti-racial um, workshops and training. So um, my question, I know you also in the same breath talk about humility and compassion. How do we hold anti-racial conversations from a place of humility and compassion? What are some of the um, the main um, considerations that you invite people to entertain when doing the, the, the work that is so taxing. It's so exhausting. I know. That's why I'm so <laughs> fat right now. Although I'm not, I mean, listen, I'm totally body positive and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I have many, the, the, the great thing about turning 50 is, is you start to give up a lot right of, you know what I fill mean? in the blank <laughs> you start, you know, it's a lot more just like listen I am what I am I think as Popeye said um mm-hmm. and and I've been you know at war with my body and myself for a long long time from all the programming and all the messages that I've gotten over the years in my family outside of my family culturally you know the whole kit and caboodle yeah. and really it's it's for me a personal choices around my health in terms of what you know what do i think do i want to you know what can i do to for whatever it's worth maximize the health that i've been given and i don't think mm-hmm. that i'm doing those things right now because i don't physically not moving as much and stuff um but to answer your question so i just want to say you know to the degree that i am totally an ally of of uh of that but you know i am I, i'm sort of feeling a little bit more round than I want to feel. <laughs> um, the, oh, I mean, this whole idea of anti-racism work, you know, you mentioned Buddhist, Buddhism and Buddhist psychology and stuff like that. The whole point of Buddhism, uh, Buddha, not Buddhism, the whole point of the teachings, the discovery, the insight is that we have obscured ske- seeing. That our, and, and that's another way of saying to translate that we are programmed by our imprinting, by our experiences. And that that could be our epigenetic, intergenerational, ancestral experiences. That could be our immediate attunement, attachment related, you know, secure, insecure, avoidant, ambivalent attachment, you know, sort of relational experiences with our early caregivers. That could be our social environment and our indust- and our institutional systemic, you know, programming in terms of whatever uh, structures are in place that either do or don't make certain things available to us in, you know, more or less numbers, whether it's food, clothing, and shelter, or bank loans, or, you know, whatever, uh, certain kinds of scholarships or, you know, job opportunities, that these are all things that we, that we receive. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to choose what we receive. We get what we get when we're born. (laughs) And in that way, that's kind of like, you could call it karma, but you could also say that it's, it's, um, you know, when I came out of my mother's womb, I, I didn't choose. Well, at least I didn't consciously choose. I don't know. We could have another conversation about, you know, sort of who gets to really be here and and why. Um, But I, I, at least to my knowledge, I didn't, I didn't choose, you know, to come into the world when I did or under the circumstances that I did. But that being said, when we do get here, when we are here, we are, as I said earlier, as human mammals, very adaptive creatures. Our nervous system is gonna respond to whatever our environment is. And when we live in a racist society because whiteness has been constructed as a uh, currency for giving white people in the United States uh, a greater status even though more white people are you know, on welfare than black people in this country. But, you know, more even, you know, that, that this is a, that this was and is a way to kind of have social privileges and access um, because I don't think the United States could ever really fully recognize, reconcile what has been done. I mean, you can't really look at the idea of chattel slavery and forced migration 
uh, unlike my grandparents who were Italian that came over, you know, uh, of African people to the United States in 400 years of, uh, you know, of enslavement, exploitation, and, and, and abuse along with indigenous uh, folks on Turtle Island, genocide and, and land theft. And mm -hmm. you can't live with that without having a sense of moral injury. So if you're a colonizer mm -hmm. and you're fleeing, say, Northern Europe because of the medieval barbarism and you're fleeing poverty and famine and, and things like that over there, or really preceding that, it was really the church uh, that said, you know, manifest destiny, the doctrine of discovery, Pope Nicholas, and all these things that basically said people who don't have white skin don't have souls, but really they just said, let me use this as an excuse to come forward and just take all your gold and take all your riches and take all of your culture and, and pretty much rape the land and do whatever we want to do so that we can have more. That's greed, back to Buddhism, one of the roots of suffering, craving more, 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 you know, it's never enough. I, I have this, I need more that this becomes a moral injury for those who carry trauma who have white bodies and it becomes a intergenerational trauma of um i just think of of having to live in the current reality of continued system systemic uh institutional and structural racism uh for everyone else and all of that is to say that when i'm teaching anti-racism work, I'm inviting people who are in white bodies or white adjacent bodies or white passing bodies, or we talk about shadism and colorism. We talk about we talk about all of these things in terms of who gets to be passing, who gets to be white-ish. Um, anybody who has those privileges based on this currency, this false notion of, of, of certain people are better than others or certain people are more deserving than others, I mean, we're starting from this place of basic goodness from the Buddhist standpoint, we're talking mm -hmm. in this place of everybody has value and worth, period. Um, every being does, but every human does in particular, even though there were laws obviously that denied women that, black people, you know, the whole thing, um, that the reason why humility is so important for white people is because shame is narcissistic. People who feel bad, feel like they're doing something good by- <laughs> Huh? I love that shame is narcissistic. Well, it's a child state of self-involvement. Absolutely. No, no, no. Yeah. It, it, it's a child state of self-involvement around the idea of I can only see the world through how how bad of a person, you know. We we've seen the opposite. We've seen how we've seen how shame is grandiose and shame is 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 narcissism, is grandiosity, is what you know. We sort of lived through four years of that, you know, of of what that means to have everyone else be the problem, right? And and but the, but but when I'm the problem and it's only me, I have contempt for myself to such a degree that I can't be in tune with anything else. I can only be defensive, or I can only shrink more, or I can only sink down more. So if someone tells me that what I did felt offensive to them because then I was in a racist, you know. You know, somebody says that's racist, or if they say, I feel like that was a microaggression because you wouldn't have done that or said that. You wouldn't have touched my hair if my hair was blonde and, you know, short. You would, you know, who gave you authority to touch my hair because it's brown and curly and puffy? I didn't, you didn't ask, I didn't authorize you. So why do you feel like you have, you know, I don't have my body sovereignty here, you know, just because I'm a person or, and, and that idea, if I were to say that to you and you're a white person, you would say, well, I didn't do that or, you know, whatever you could get defensive or you could get really shameful and you could totally sink back and, you know, you could say, well, I'm never going to give anybody a compliment again or something mm -hmm. like that. But who is that about? That's about you. It's not about the other person. So individual racism and individual race, he, healing from racism, anti-racism efforts is being able to hold yourself in positive, warm regard, regardless, and take in what the person is saying around the idea of it was offensive to them. And this isn't PC, you know, people don't have a right to free speech. This is, I'm relational. I care. I have compassion. I care about another person. If I'm in relationship to all things and everyone, then even if I disagree with the person or if they're not someone I know very well, I treat everyone with respect and dignity. And that means that I actually care two shits about what they're experiencing. And if I'm the cause of that, one of the basic tenets of Buddhism is to do non-harming, what's skillful and not skillful. Well, I don't want to harm people intentionally. And I'm not saying, I mean, this is me, Francesca, saying, I'm not saying I 
do this perfectly all the time. I'm saying this is the idea, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is that you would then be able to repair. And America, Americans are horrible at repair. Western culture has no interest in repair. They just want to forget it and move on and bury it under the rug and keep going. And we have a land, we have landfills worth of stuff that needs repair in our families, in our, in our histories, in our, you know, in these big systemic issues in terms of black codes and Jim Crow laws and, you know, broken treaties and, you know, I mean, you look at Japanese internment camps, they got some money after that. You look at the GI Bill, no black person, not no, but like 98% of that money after the war uh, went for housing uh, for white people, not with black, not for black people. So when you start to kind of put these things together, the moral injury that white Americans mm -hmm. or people in, you know, carry needs a sense of humility to be able to deal with the narcissistic shame which is a block to their being able to be compassionate. And when you can be compassionate and you open your heart, then you can kind of look at the structures and you can see, well, I've been hoodwinked too. I've been bamboozled too. I thought that it was not even a big deal. I didn't even know that I had all these invisible backpack privileges of being white or white passing. And wait a minute, you mean to tell me that we live in a world where people didn't get this or that, or, you know, like I thought slavery was over. I thought, and then you can begin to say like, well, now I have righteous rage, moral outrage. Then I can really, you know, it's like Thich Nhat Hanh's sort of active engagement, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King's sort of mm -hmm. active engagement around how I become an, you know, an involved person around this uh, embodied anti-racism. I live it, I think it, I feel it, but I actually do stuff about it. And that is the heavy lift because there are the policies that need to change institutionally. And then there's the things at an individual level. And you have to find your lane, I think, and you can do a both mm -hmm. and or an and and so you can work to vote in right people like Stacey Abrams, and you can try to block gerrymandering and things like that. But you can also sort of look at your own stuff on a daily basis to say, well, where am I being discriminatory internally to myself or externally to others? Because we've all we're all racist. Let's just name it. We are all racist. How could we not be? We were born into a racist society. Now, if you are aware of that and you can act to change that and electively and deliberately do something different, good. Then you're an anti-racist racist, as Ibram Kenzie says. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. So it, it sounds like the humility and compassion are um, kind of ushered in through self-compassion first is what I'm hearing you say. That in order for that person to move, they have to turn to themselves and find some way to um, muster some self-compassion and understanding of their own predicament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people, most people that I've seen be successful at this work through the trauma of my alcoholic father, my Correct. bipolar mother, right. my, you know, my uh, sexually abusive grandfather, my, uh, you know, uh, gang ridden, you mm -hmm. know, neighborhood or whatever it is. They work through these things first and couple it with a systemic awareness of oh my goodness, I didn't know what 40 acres and a mule meant. You mean the people who were enslaved who got that, had it for like a few years and then it got yanked back and the money went back to the landowners in the South who were the original enslavers because they were getting uppity. Oh, I didn't know that. Now that I know that and I've worked through my personal trauma, I can see the roots of where this inequity you know, keeps coming. But you need the facts, but you can't put the facts on intellectually, which is one of the problems that a lot of people have had. They know the facts, but they're not, they're still inside. They're grappled in their own shame because they still have these false core beliefs that they're not a good person, basically, which is bullshit. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just have and programming. I mean, the belief is a real belief, but well, it's, the, it's, it's, but it, but it's fake news. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's what Reggie Mara um, talks about: these uh, cultural givens mm -hmm. that are trickled into our lives and our um, and shape us. And in order for us to 
get to, to begin to do this work, we have to know what the givens are, what mm-hmm. we were, um, you know, all the gifts that were put in our cradle um, and then the ones as we as we grow up. So it begins there. So in the same, in this same vein, um, collective healing is one of the themes that runs through my work and through this podcast and through your work. So you you have a proposal for embracing and facilitating collective mourning. Mm. And I just wanted you to give us some ideas of how you um, facilitate that for people, the the processing, um, because that is what's needed. I mean, that's what you're saying. It's like, we are all in this together. And, you know, when I think about my grandmother's hands, um, I think uh, that uh, Resma, um, was able to capture things, um, you know, the, the the length of the cloth, as uh, the poet said, uh, Naomi Shihab Nye says. Um, so this is collective injury, injuries, There and, and there has to be a collective healing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So tell us about collective mourning. Well, I mean, we, you know, it's been said that the um, idea that you're both exceptional and not special is is, <laughs> is sort of a, the paradox that people have, you know, right. difficulty with, that, yeah. that you can be unique and also um, what many might say suffer from, but I would mm-hmm. say celebrate with a common humanity, right? Mm-hmm. That there mm-hmm. is, that there is that. And that there's there, there's rest in that, you know. That there's mm-hmm. that there's um, a sense of being held in that mm-hmm. in, our, mm-hmm. in our common humanity. And yet, we can never access our collective common humanity if we are uh, so programmed and so, uh, you know, we took the bait on the mm-hmm. uh, idea of. Uh, this idea of rugged individualism and and sort of having to figure it out all on yourself and you know the strength is in being able to do everything on your own. So we're told every day you shouldn't need to have a collective mourning. We're we're told you can't even take more than two days off from work when your mother dies or something, you know. But I think that it begins, you know, most of my work ideally happens with people from the inside out. You are able to, but but it can also work from the outside in. So if you if you're able to take part in a collective mourning or a collective healing ceremony, I think it can also work where you begin to then perhaps decalcify or decondition. That might start to you know sort of uh, uh, you know be like acid you know poured on something and sort of kind of drip away some of your own walls uh, and, and, and traumas and hardened places inside. But as far as ritual is concerned, I mean, there are, oh my goodness, um, as far as- um, <laughs> of course, There is a ritual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly. She's so, That's it. <laughs> she's so funny. That's Penny. She's my- She's very much. Uh, she knows. She knows. <laughs> she was like, "Don't you know? Here, here <laughs> is a collective, a way to do the collective." That's that's true, and I and I think you can, and I think people have. I think that when so with collective mourning, I mean, in in theory, we're always honoring one another in the land, and we're mm-hmm. always honoring, you know, through funerals, through mm-hmm. you know any kind of whether it's a quinceanera, a birthday party, a wedding, a funeral, you know, there's always going to be this ebb and flow of life, this birth and death, this sort of, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh would say there is no birth, no death, but you could also argue that, you know, that which arises is that which passes. And so it's, you know, however you want to look at it. What am I trying to say here? You have to grieve your own history around what you didn't get and what wasn't 
what you wanted and what wasn't what you needed. And you have to know that you're not still that little five-year-old or 10-year-old that was abused because if you're here talking or neglected, because if you're here talking, then you're here. So mm -hmm. there's some part of you that made it. And that process of starting to heal that opens us up to being able to recognize our common humanity, which then can set the groundwork and the scaffolding and the framework for a strong, in my opinion, for a strong tapestry of what would be collective mourning, whether it's a sorry day, whether it's a truth and reconciliation project, whether it's restorative justice circles, whether it's uh, family therapy where you work on repair in terms of misunderstandings within the family. You know, um, if you do genograms, if you're a therapist and you go back in the family line, you'll discover that people who committed suicide and people who, you know, lost the, you know, millions of dollars and, you know, that there can be a collective mourning around this is our inheritance. And also this is how we're working together to kind of actively engage in creating something new or allowing something new to be born, that we're able to grieve this process of what was and open to something new and that we can be in communication with our ancestors and we can be open to, you know, who, as I said earlier, is, has yet to come. And that may be in a human form or a spirit form, or it could be in an animal form or a land form or a water form or something. But I think these rituals, sometimes when you see someone like Kobe Bryant die, or you see someone like, you know, um, Virgil Abloh die, or you see someone like, uh, uh, you know, I remember I was working in television when um, my Angelo died. Uh, you know, there is a process of, and Thich Nhat Hanh just died. Um, okay. You know, there's a, there's a process that people can go through of engaging in collective mourning in that way about a body's passing that can help us root together in our, in our strength. But from a deep level, from an anti-racism level, I think this idea of, mourning the fact that the way we live kills us and, mm -hmm. and recognizing that uh, and recognizing that out of that acknowledgement and that mourning and that grief, a new imagination will, will emerge uh, and that we have you know, one another to, to hold one another in that and to sort of inspire one another in that. I just don't think it's the way that we've been taught to think that much anymore. Um, but to invite that, I think, again, is, is important. And to create them, to create those rituals in your communities, in your neighborhoods, with your schools, with your churches, you know, um, with your whatever it is, uh, to create them. Yeah. I like that you're saying to recreate, because if we go back to the um, ancestral wisdom, these collective um, way of celebrating and mourning and doing all of was there. So I, I thank you so much for giving us an insight into your work, the beautiful work that you are doing and and also to exemplify, to embody what um, spiritual activism is, because that's what you are doing out there. And um, and just through through your answers today, you gave us uh, very uh, graspable examples of that and how the journey has to go inward to then mushroom out. But it has to, we have to go through the I to the we. Yes, and, and, and I should also just add that even if you don't want to dig, dig, dig in, if you mm -hmm. can always stay open enough to allow what mm -hmm. might be trying to reach you to come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do believe that, right? Yeah. Like be yeah. open to allowing that. And to just say one final thing about Thich Nhat Hanh, he was depressed mm -hmm. and sitting there talking to his mother, sitting at the moon, looking at the moon. And mm -hmm. one minute he said, oh, that's my mother there. My mother is the moon. So he went from being depressed and lonely to feeling very connected and that she was mm -hmm. still right there. And right. so he was open to receiving yeah. her there as yeah. the moon to come in. So he, yeah. you know, so, I mean, and he's clearly this great, you know, teacher. he was. I mean, I'm still mourning. Um, I I listen to him every day. I haven't. I had to stop, for, even though he encouraged us not to mourn. But I was mourning, and I just yesterday um, was able to get myself to go back to listening. 
Um, but what a gift, what a gift, both him and you. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, one last thing, how um, we said your website. Um, yeah. What if else do you want people? Me. Yeah. If, if anybody wants to reach me, they can just go to my website, maximeclarity.com, M-A-X-I-M-E-C-L-A-R-I-T-Y.com. It's just my last name and clarity. And um, I work with adults, couples, families, uh, individuals, groups, and um, organizations uh, in the best way that I can to help support change. And so if you, you know, want to reach out, you can contact me through the website. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to what a word is worth. We can, um, you can access today's interview and um, all the others through Anchor or YouTube. And if you are interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you find our program beneficial, leave us a review. I am with you in love and compassion, always, 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 always.